Good morning. My name is George Keroku. I teach political science here at WCC. On behalf of Professors Barbara Connolly, Fahad Amin, and myself, I'd like to welcome you all to the second lecture in a series of conversations that we're going to hold throughout the 2014 and 15 academic year. These conversations are part of our program, uh, which is sponsored by the State University of New York's uh, Conversations in the Discipline program. Uh, this is a grant provided by SUNY CID, and our theme for the entire semester, uh, entire year, is poverty, misconceptions, and realities. What we are trying to do is bring together scholars, academics, and thinkers who have spent considerable number of years think about the issue of poverty. And we had our first one with Professor Paul Krugman of Princeton University and New York Times columnist. Now, I'll just at this time take a, say a few things about the SUNY uh, CID, which is a grant program designed to bring together SUNY faculty and visiting scholars from non-SUNY institutions to examine new trends, address changes and challenges, review promising research, and become acquainted with professional developments in their fields and on other campuses. We are very pleased to have some of our colleagues from other SUNY campuses with us today. I would also like to acknowledge the support we've received from the Marta and Ted Nuremberg Endowed Faculty Chair for Economics, Business, Strategy, and Carl and Lily Forzheimer's Foundation Endowed Chair for Business and Public Policy. Um, last but not the least, I'd like to thank Dr. Iris Cook and Heather Shank uh, for all the help they provided us during the preparation for this uh, conversations. Now I'll turn over to my colleague, Professor Fahad Amin, uh, to introduce our guest. But before I do that, I would like to uh, mention to the students, we have about three classes here today, that at 11.50, we would have a short break for the classes to leave. And please do so uh, with uh, quietly so that we don't disturb uh, the other audience. Now, I would also su suggest, especially to my students, to send their last text messages and then turn, the, <laughs> turn, turn their phones off. Right. So, Fahad. Okay. Thanks, George. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, my name is Farhad Amin. I teach economics at the college. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Professor Sylvia Nasser, who is the John S. and James L. Knight Professor of Business Journalism at Columbia University. Uh, now, those of us who dabble in economic ideas sometimes find it a bit disconcerting that others often find economics a bit dry and dull and maybe even downright dismal. Not my students, of course. <laughs> Uh, I suspect the reason for that is that uh, there's not a high correlation between uh, being a good economist and a good writer. Uh, and often brilliant economists uh, are not very good at translating their ideas into plain language. Uh, but uh, there are certainly exceptions, and Sylvia Nasser definitely defies the trend. She, is not only, uh, she, she has not only a deep knowledge of economics, but is a very elegant writer. Uh, for years, I have followed her columns in the New York Times, her articles on economic ideas. And uh, I always marveled at how seamlessly and with such ease she took uh, complex economic ideas and translated them into simple language for everyone to understand without making it overly simplistic or without watering down the ideas. And that's certainly a great art. Uh, she also 
the other thing I liked about her writing is she always gave us a glimpse into the people who came up with these ideas. And uh, you, many of you may know her award-winning book, uh, Beautiful Mind, which was about the uh, mathematician John Nash, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics after many decades of uh, mental illness. And some of you may even have seen the movie that was inspired by the book play, with Russell Crowe in the lead role. Uh, when, when we um, were trying to conceive of, when we conceived of this series uh, on poverty, we wanted a speaker who would give us a, a sort of a long view, a historical view of poverty in the world and thinking about it. And immediately we thought of Sylvia Nasser because of her latest book, which is called Grand Pursuit, The Story of Economic Genius. Uh, and I understand some of what we're going to hear today is based around the same theme. Uh, and we are delighted that she accepted our invitation to come and speak. Uh, Sylvia Nasser uh, has a uh, master's degree in economics from New York University, having worked with the Nobel laureate Vasily Leontief. She has been an economics correspondent for the New York Times, a writer for Fortune, a columnist for U.S. News and World Report, and has published in a number of other uh, journals and publications. She has been a visiting scholar at Cambridge University, the Russell Sage Foundation, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And we are delighted to have her here. And so please uh, join me in welcoming Sylvia Nassif, Professor Sylvia Nassif. Thank you. It's great to be here. I want to thank Professor Amin and the Department of Economics and the SUNY Conversations and Disciplines program for this wonderful opportunity. I am going to draw on um, I'm going to draw on um, the history of both ideas and and the history of po of poverty and the fight to overcome poverty. Uh, that I wrote about in Grand Pursuit, and I just want, we just want to show, warm up a little bit. Author of Grand Pursuit, The Story of Economic Genius. The History of Economic Progress in Four Minutes. 1811, the average Englishman lives little better than a Roman slave. Potatoes are a luxury. 1840, the mid-Victorian boom marks the beginning of the modern revolution in living standards. 1842, Charles Dickens writes an instant bestseller, The Christmas Carol. He calls for an end to class warfare and better wages. 1850, Henry Mayhew, a founder of Punch, invents investigative reporting with a 90-part series about London's poorest workers. 1866, Labor's share of national income is rising. Karl Marx's own income puts him in the top 2% of British households. 1867, Das Kapital goes to press without Karl Marx ever visiting a factory. 1870, Alfred Marshall wonders why every man can't be a gentleman, someone who can afford to enjoy leisure and to educate his children. 1898, Carnegie Steel triples output without increasing its workforce, thanks to superior management and brain workers. 1908, Beatrice Webb invents the idea of the welfare state. 1911, Irving Fisher endorses the idea of a diversified stock portfolio. Maynard Keynes disagrees and advocates buying and selling one stock at a time. 1918, Keynes convinces the British Treasury to invest in French painting instead of French loans. Irving Fisher invents the cost of living adjustment, raising the staff salaries in step with inflation. 1929, Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek predicts that the U.S. boom will end in a bust. 1931, President Herbert Hoover responds to the Great Depression with tax cuts, easier money, and public work spending. 1936, Keynes loads up on U.S. stock and becomes wealthy. 1945, 
Hayek warns that government control of the private sector will destroy political freedom, yet supports government action to promote post-war economic recovery. 1952, Mao Zedong comes to power. China's standard of living is only 50% of Africa's and 5% of America's. 1960, Joan Robinson denies the Great Leap has resulted in famine, even as Mao declines foreign food aid. 1963, Paul Samuelson says he'd rather write the nation's economic textbooks than its laws. JFK proposes a tax cut that leads to faster economic growth and a falling federal deficit. 19... Jimmy Carter that easy money and too much regulation is to blame for the nation's economic woes. 1998, Amartya Sen becomes the first Asian to win an economics Nobel. 2010, even after the worst financial crisis since the 1930s, U.S. per capita income is still higher than at the peak of the 1990s boom or in the mid aughts for the story of how economic geniuses changed history, read Grand Pursuit by Sylvia Nasser. talk about now is, is whether it's realistic to think that, um, that extreme poverty and destitution could actually be eliminated, if not within my lifetime, then within your lifetime. And so I'm going to draw on the history of the last 150 years, and in particular on the ideas of two of two thinkers, um, Alfred Marshall and Beatrice Webb, to um, try to um, begin to answer that question. Okay, so for the bottom nine tenths of humanity, the world has changed more in the last 150 years than in the 20 centuries before then. The idea that people would not have their lives be ruled by dire necessity is so new that Jane Austen never entertained it. Uh, by 1800, when Jane was um, just beginning to pick up her pen, England was becoming radically richer thanks to, uh, thanks to trade, thanks to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, and yet, Adam Smith, that enlightened and optimistic economic thinker, um, believed that while believed that while the nation could become richer, the bottom nine tenths of the population, that is the the part of the population that probably most of us would have fallen into, could never rise above subsistence. In fact, England, in the richest country in the world, which is what England was then, having just surpassed uh, the Dutch, in the richest country in the world in 1800, the average citizen didn't live any better than a Roman slave 2,000 years earlier. The material circumstances of that typical Englishman who was, in fact, a farm laborer um, were, he lived in a, um, a one-room, uh, dark, smoky dwelling, uh, leaky, cold in the winter, light and heat were just this, a fire, um, his clothes were the ones he wore on his back. 
His transportation were his own feet. He had no education. His food was of the most uh, coarse kind when he had enough. And when he wasn't actually starving, he lived in anxiety and fear of death by hunger. He had no, no reason to believe that his children would live any better. And that was true uh, for generation after generation. The, um, the average standard of living simply never departed far from subsistence. Material conditions like that called for resignation. Resignation was the realistic way of looking at life. One's station in life was determined as much as, um, as physiognomy, as, as much as your eye color. Um, in Jane Austen's lifetime, everybody knew their place. Now, the kind of question that David Copperfield, okay, Dickens' hero of um, uh, 1950, the kind of question that David Copperfield asked um, was not to be thought of in Jane Austen's time. Because, of course, the ordinary person could not be the hero of their own life. That is, the ordinary person could not um, could not possibly um, um, imagine that he or she would have the means with which to pursue their own ends. That was not, that was not um, in, you know, that was not within the realm of possibility. And if you uh, have you ever read uh, Great Expectations, which is, about the subject of inheritance, um, the idea that a blacksmith's son could aspire to be a gentleman was so outlandish that not only did Pip, the hero, have to, you know treat it as a great secret that he had to, that he couldn't confide in anyone except his best friend, but for Pip to rise from this lowly position to uh, his gentlemanly status as a sac required the intervention of pirates and um, Miss Havisham and all kinds of fantastical things because that it took that kind of um, sort of um, you know intervention, dramatic intervention, to even imagine that such a thing was possible. So the idea that man's fate, the human condition, was um, that people were creatures of circumstances, and that those circumstances were not predetermined, not immutable, or impervious to human intervention, is a radical idea, a radical idea that was not um, by no means um, even considered by the leading thinkers of the Enlightenment. Wasn't really an, you know, wasn't an idea that, um, um, that existed before about the middle of the 19th century around the time that uh, Charles Dickens uh, wrote The Christmas Carol. Um, and Dickens, um, Dickens, therefore, I think, I treat as sort of the, the, the pivotal figure um, in the invention of modern economics. Because in The Christmas Carol, which Dickens wrote after he got back from his book tour in America, where he came back, you know, England was in a depression, 
Uh, there was, you know, hunger and starvation widespread, and you know everyone was very, very pessimistic about the future. Um, Dickens had just been in the United States, where his main, you know, he, which he hated, by the way, except that except that his overwhelming impression was one of abundance, of abundant food, of you know. Optimistic um, optimism about the future, and um, so he wrote the Christmas Carol, which is about the the contrast between what he now believed was an, the obsolete idea that the world was always going to be a place of scarcity and and universal poverty, with the idea of abundance. The, the Christmas Carol is full of images of uh, grocery stores that are laden with food and um, big feet, you know, the Christmas feast, which, which Dickens was saying that, no, the world of, you know, the world of the past, which was a world of scarcity and universal poverty, is no more. Something has happened to um, turn it into a world of abundance where um, people could hope to live better from generation to generation. Um, now, Dickens was you know, not only a novelist, he was also the editor of a magazine. He published a lot of, a lot of um, um, articles about economics. This was a big debate. But his optimism about, um, about the possibility of the poor um, um, living better in the future and rising was flew in the face of conventional wisdom. Of course, the, the radicals like Car his contemporary Karl Marx, who was in, um, who was in London at the time, um, uh, argued that not only, not only would, um, would people remain poor, but they were going to get even poorer uh, with the Industrial Revolution. John Stuart Mill was a socialist. He was the leading economist of the day. He was a feminist. He was by no means a conservative. He thought that all of the inventions of the Industrial Revolution that so impressed Dickens and so convinced Dickens that um, the sort of old constraints on production and living standards were now, had now been broken, John Stuart Mill said, you know, to the contrary, all these mechanical inventions have enabled, have only enabled a greater population to live the same life of drudgery, imprisonment, and poverty. And of course, um, uh, Thackeray, one of the great novelists of that period, um, believed, as people always had, that poverty was like death, disease, winter. It was simply a fact of life. So the um, Alfred Marshall is, is the first modern economist in the sense that before Marshall, economics was about what you couldn't do. Okay, the nation could get richer but the bulk of the population couldn't rise. Um, after Marshall, economics became about what you could do. And the main, the main impetus, the main impetus for Marshall, who was, the, who was the son of a clerk, he was poor, grew up in uh, central London, but wound up rising like Pip, but not through any fantastical means, um, 
but by a scholarship to Cambridge, wound up living the life of a gentleman. And wondered um, in the middle of a, another depression in the 1860s, wondered if, why, why couldn't everyone uh, aspire to rising to a standard of living above, above the, above the poverty that made a life of choice and thought and hope for your, um, that your children would live better, why couldn't everybody do that? He, uh, he took a trip up to the north of England. He walked around the, um, the slums of Manchester, um, looking into the face of, of the factory workers and wondered why couldn't they do what he had done. So when he went back to Cambridge, his older and wiser friends said, well, you better study some political economy um, because um, um, what you're thinking is, is, you know, is, is totally unrealistic. Um, What, what Marshall did, though, so Marshall studied Marx, he studied Mill, he, um, un, you know, he understood the argument why, why wages were te tethered to subsistence, um, the, you know, as they had been for, you know, the, uh, all of history, namely that, namely that, uh, that, um, Mill, Adam Smith, Marx all believe that that um, that wages were simply a function of the supply of laborers. So, if um, if times were good, um, workers would marry earlier; they'd have more children, um, and wages. Uh, would fall right back down to subsistence. Okay, so there was never, never any connection between the um, the inventions and rising production caused by um, the technological revolution and wages. What Marshall did, uh, he did exactly what Karl Marx didn't do, namely he. Um, he um, visited a lot of factories, both in England and the United States. He learned about the production methods um, of many, many businesses. And he had, an, he had this insight that of two things. One is that, that what, what um, um, seemed to be happening is that um, competition in a, in a free market where firms, you know, firms had to compete, the competition was forcing managers and owners of businesses to constantly, day in and day out, look for incremental ways to do more with the resources that they had. Okay, and that that was leading to greater and greater efficiencies, you know, greater and greater productivity, so that so that um, that um, at the level of companies and the economy as a whole, um, the you know you could do more with given resources. Okay. But the second, this, his second insight, which is, was the critical one, is that the same competition uh, forced business owners to share the gains of productivity with workers. And that wages, that wages 
which were the, you know, determined the living standards of most people, that wages were rising with productivity. So all these great inventions that, that, um, that were raising production were not, were making the nation richer, but actually real wages were going up. So there was a mechanism, an ingenious mechanism at the heart of the economy of this, you know, um, market economy that was lifting the proletariat. Okay, and in contrast to in contrast to the received wisdom that the economy needed a proletariat, namely, namely a class of people who lived no better than livestock and only existed to work to produce wealth for a tiny minority. Okay, his view, his view, his insight about productivity and its connection to wages suggested that, that the, a, there was an internal dynamic that was going to lift average living standards. Okay, this was a radical departure. This, um, um, you know, n was neither resignation nor, nor the, um, nor the um, uh, view that, that it was impossible within the existing society for workers, you know, for the bottom nine-tenths to escape poverty. Okay. All right. So, so Marshall, Marshall was basically, um, um, you know, was basically doing what, what Marx, his contemporary, did not do, which is to recognize what was going on around him in London. He's seeing that productivity was rising, that real wages, um, that is, um, um, you know, wages, uh, adjusted for inflation, adjusted for purchasing power, were shooting up. And you can see here that this is a chart of, of real wages in, um, in, um, in England. And you can see that for, this is from 1200 to the middle of the 19th century, they're, they're, they're flat, okay? There's no improvement in the average standard of living. And then something really radical is happening, and Marshall is the one who um, recognized that this was not an accident of the, of the moment. This was something that was, that was being caused by a basic dynamic in the economy and that it was going to continue and that the consequences of that were that the bulk of the people could escape poverty, okay? And, the, and, the, and, that, the, and that the means was go and the institution that was gonna make that possible was the business firm, the corporation. So another way of saying that is the social function of the modern corporation is to raise living standards and reduce poverty, okay? Almost exactly the opposite of what many of his contemporaries and many of our contemporaries believe. Okay, so this is, again, um, this, this chart goes, this is per capita, um, uh, Income, um, you know, not, it's not wages, it's per capita income, so the whole population. And you can see that, again, this goes back to um, um, 
you know, the year zero, and you can see that, um, that per capita income sort of fluctuates around a completely flat trend, so that, so that this modern period, this last 150 years, is a radical, radical departure from anything else that happened before. So you went from universal poverty to a continuous, if uneven, increase in average living standards. Okay. So this was, you know, this summarizes what, um, um, you know, Marshall's insights and, and, and the implications of that. Um, now, By the 1890s, um, it was obvious to, you know, this, that is uh, 20 or 30 years after, um, you know, after um, Marshall, you know, had, had his insights, it was the, the, you know, the debate over whether, um, whether uh, economic growth was benefiting the bulk of the population was pretty much settled. Most people saw that, that wages were rising, that the working class was living better, was you know, consuming more food, um, had better housing, et cetera, et cetera. But, but um, it was also, also um, the case that still the bottom one third of, um, of L London's inhabitants were so impoverished that they could neither work nor serve in the military nor educate their children. Okay, they were destitute. So amid, so Instead of the, you know, the problem was no longer universal and, and permanent poverty. It was poverty amid plenty, okay? You know, in general, things were, you know, in general, uh, people lived better, but there was a significant group that, um, that was so poor that their poverty caused caused, it was self-reinforcing. It was poverty causing poverty because um, their children simply couldn't, um, um, you know, couldn't live better because, uh, you know, they couldn't get educated. They, they were so poorly nourished. Um, so Beatrice Webb uh, is a, was the next generation uh, after Marshall. She is a uh, beautiful, extremely wealthy heiress and um, who, um, who is one of nine sisters destined f to be the wife of a rich man. And indeed, her sisters all married um, wealthy and powerful men. And Beatrice, however, had um, had another idea, which is she was, um, for whatever reason, she uh, wanted to very much to um, uh, to make a difference. She very much wanted to educate herself. She very much wanted to make a difference. Um, in the um, uh, when she was about twenty. Um, the, um, the question for thinking Victorians had become, um, had become the issue of poverty. She, she became a, um, so instead of, instead of going to um, uh, debutante balls, she became a social investigator. Um, her, her mentor was Herbert Spencer, 
He's a great libertarian, a great, uh, probably the last great champion of the minimal, uh, minimal government. But he was, um, he was also a feminist, and he encouraged Beatrice to first work as a, a social worker, which she did for a while, and then to become a um, um, and sort of an undercover investigative journalist. Um, she was, um, she thought she would, wanted to write and um, um, investigative journalism, going into the slums and then writing exposés had become very fashionable. Beatrice did that and, um, and um, slowly started moving from a very, very libertarian, uh, you know, no government uh, position to the idea that perhaps, um, perhaps the government could do something about poverty without damaging the ingenious mechanism that was, that was lifting productivity and wages for the economy as a whole. Um, she, you know, the conventional wisdom, again, embraced by liberals as well as conservatives, was that if you tax the rich, if you tax the most productive members of society to subsidize the least productive, you are going to um, um, uh, cripple the economy's ability to grow and to you know, continue to lift the average living standard. Her argument was that, um, was a kind of supply side argument. She didn't argue, you know, she didn't argue that, um, that this was the right thing to do. Uh, she didn't make a moral argument. She made a supply side argument. She argued that, that by, um, by improving the, the nutrition and housing and public health of the bottom third that um, actually uh, that would add to the economy's uh, growth potential because all these people who are too incapacitated to work would now uh, join the labor force. She, um, her, her great, um, the person who first took up her idea was not, I mean, most people think of the welfare state as being a product of the Depression and of the New Deal. No, it was not. It was uh, actually the product of um, Beatrice Webb's influence on one Winston Churchill, who um, Beatrice married a, um, a sort of quasi-socialist named Sidney Webb. They, they ran a kind of salon for policymakers, kind of a think tank, and the person who uh, came to their dinners was the young, the young Tory politician, um, uh, Winston Churchill, who, um, who like, like Beatrice, had, um, you know, earlier, discovered poverty, wanted to do something about it, and took up Beatrice's idea that the government should, should guarantee every citizen a minimum standard of living. Okay, she called it the household state, we call it the welfare state. And, um, and when, um, when the you know liberals won the government in 1908, Winston Churchill uh, became a government minister and passed all kinds of legislation that was truly revolutionary, including a minimum wage. Um, all right. So um, you know Beatrice's idea was that some poverty is caused by poverty, and you know and can't. Um, and can't be overcome by economic growth. Uh, the government should guarantee every citizen a minimum. Um, it's not going to, it's not in fundamental, um, 
Um, it doesn't fundamentally contradict the conditions needed for economic growth. And, um, it, and her idea was even more sophisticated than merely um, that the welfare state should ameliorate poverty. It was that it should prevent it. In other words, it was not just relief, it was also investing in, in um, what today we would call human capital that would actually enable people to increase their own productivity and earn more. Okay, so now let's, you know, let me just talk a little bit about the track record. Okay, was, you know, were these, you know, were these predictions, Marshall's prediction that, that the market economy um, the competition among firms would raise, would raise productivity and living standards. Beatrice Webb's uh, prediction that, that taxing the most productive to, uh, people to subsidize the poor would not, would not harm growth, would enhance it. But, you know, let's just look at the, the, the data. Um, you can see here that the, you know that as as um, dramatic as the change was in the 19th century in living standards, the 20th century uh, dwarfs it. Um, what? What? Yes. Yes. You. If anybody needs to leave for a class, this is a good. Yes. Time. Please. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, okay. So I should really, yeah. What? The, the, the chart before was the world. The chart before was the world. This is. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so living standards did continue to, you know, did, did rise radically. Um, um, wages did go up with, with productivity increases so that, um, so that you know the um, the benefits of innovation, of, of better management, of organiz uh, actually were. You know, this is this is these are data for the United States. Um, um, the um, um, if you look at, if you compare uh, countries by, uh, by their standards of living, by their average per capita income, almost all of those differences are accounted for by productivity, okay? So, so the, way that, the way that people escape poverty is primarily because of rising productivity, okay? Overwhelmingly, okay. Um, all right, let's. Um, so, um, so since 18, 1820, pop, you know, the global population has gone up six times, um, but output has gone up 60 times. So the average standard of living has grown, um, grown tenfold despite a sixfold increase in 
the population, okay? And along with that has come a, um, you know, a increase in life expectancy of two and a half times, a, you know, almost a doubling of calorie intake. Now we're gonna go to, um, um, and a radical reduction in poverty, okay? So in Jane Austen's day, poverty was the norm. Nine, you know, nine out of 10 people were destitute. And that has, um, that has changed radically, okay? Now, now poverty is not the norm, it's the exception. It's not the, most of the population, it's a s relatively small part of the population, okay? And um, just to give an idea of how quickly this, you know, poverty is being um, reduced, uh, this, you know, Barrow and Salome e. Martin, who, you know, looked at, um, you know, 200 countries over a long period of time, um, um, show that this is absolute poverty, okay? This is, um, this is a dollar and a half a day. This is what, this is a line between, you know, anything below that is destitution, okay? But that has 20% um, of the world's population had incomes of $1.50 a day or less in 1970. And today, it's, uh, you know, it's been reduced by two-thirds, mostly through economic growth. This is also true if you look at the gap between rich and poor globally. Um, looked at by um, the, black, the black line shows um, just the, the gap between the richest and poorest countries, okay? Not weighted by population. So that Canada, which has, I don't know, 300 million people versus China, which has more than a billion, equally weighted. But, so if you weight, if you weight countries, there's a, um, a sharp narrowing of the gap between rich and poor, showing that poor countries, namely, I mean, a lot of this is India and China are growing faster than rich countries, so the gap is narrowing. Um, but even, even if you just look at countries without taking into account how big they are and thinking, and you, know, you have to realize that, that there are many more countries now uh, than there were, say, in 1960, and, um, and yet even, even there, uh, the gap is closing, okay? So people, so the poor are getting rich faster. Um, the Beatrice Webb's prediction that, that the welfare state would not, would not impede uh, economic growth, okay, which is an ongoing debate, of course, I like to ask people um, who the, you know, which country has the best stock market performance and which has the second best. Can anyone guess? Hmm? Who, who is the best long-term economic perform, stock market performance? The U.S. But the second, the second one, which, um, um, which people rarely guess, so congratulations, is Sweden. And you see that, um, that in 1870, um, the U.S. had, you know, government as a share of GDP was 
higher than Sweden's. If you look down in 1996, um, government spending, including transfers, transfer payments, in other words, social security payments, um, twice as big in Sweden as, as in the United States. But they have had very similar rates of productivity growth, right, as evidenced by A, their stock market performance, and B, the actual productivity numbers. So it would seem, uh, it would seem, and this is generally true for European countries, which are, um, which have, um, you know, uh, much bigger governments relative to their economies than the United States. Uh, so it would seem that that what Sweden and the United States have in common, which is an extremely competitive um, private sector, um, matters more. Um, that if you have an extremely competitive private sector, which is producing rapid productivity growth, you can afford to um, you can afford to spend a lot of resources to reduce poverty, okay? It's, you can have any size welfare state that you want. Americans want a smaller one, the Swedes want a bigger one. But, um, but it is not, does not seem to be true that, that having a welfare state that, um, that, um, uh, reduces poverty, uh, uh, you know, impedes growth. And this is another illustration of that, different way of looking at it. This is global data, and all I'm doing here is comparing, comparing the increase in living standards by era. And the, you know, the post-war era is obviously the era of, uh, in which um, uh, welfare states and social, social benefits uh, have become very large and, um, and both in terms of the increase in living standards and the decline in poverty, the post-war period is, um, you know, um, perform better than the pre-19, the pre-World War I sort of golden age of, um, of market economies. Um, you know, again, uh, evidence that, that, um, that you know, re reducing poverty through the welfare state and rapid pro productivity growth um, uh, are not are not incompatible. Um, now, the United States. This is this shows um, what the poverty rate is if you only count market market income uh, compared to the poverty rate after you um, take account of taxes and transfers, in other words, the effects of, of um, anti-poverty programs like Social Security um, and um, et cetera. And you see that what's interesting here is that Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries have pre-tax pre and pre-transfer poverty rates that are as high as the United States. Okay, which is not a common perception. And that, um, but that, af you know, once you take into account the, you know, the effects of welfare state spending, um, the poverty, poverty rates are much lower. Um, they're, the Swedes do more to reduce poverty. And this, by the way, is, a, is it not the, is not the American, you know, poverty line. This is a relative measure. Um, this is 50% of the median income, okay? So um, it's a more, you know, more expansive uh, definition of poverty. And um, um, and 
and the you know welfare state has a big has a big impact now the united states appears to do less to reduce poverty uh, than the Scandinavian countries. Um, the comparison is slightly unfair because, because the, the most other countries give poor people cash, whereas the United States gives poor people things, food stamps, um, uh, Medicaid, uh, housing assistance, it's all in kind, and that's not counted here. Um, um, you know, the, the income at the bottom of the income distribution has been growing uh, and growing significantly once you take taxes and transfers into account, even in the United States. Um, Okay, so this is another way of, of uh, showing that. And poverty in the United States has declined very dramatically since, since the 1960s. Um, if, you, if you measure, you know, if you use the measure that most economists and poverty experts would embrace, that includes all of these in-kind, um, all of this in-kind income. Okay, so the official measure is very pessimistic. It's just flat, no improvement in, um, let's see, 67, 77, 87, 90, in 40 years, which um, is very discouraging, but in fact, um, um, a more appropriate measure shows a, um, shows a, large, a large decrease. Okay, so, my point is that uh, that history, um, the history of the last 150 years or the history of the last few decades, um, should make us relatively confident that um, that poverty can be reduced or even eliminated. Um, in the, over the next generation. Um, it's dependent on, in poor countries where the bulk of the population is poor, obviously you can't, you can't uh, eliminate poverty just by transferring income from the affluent to the poor. Right? I mean, that's, that's the situation of, that's the situation of England in 1850. Nin, you know, 90% of the population is poor. You can't fix it with income transfers. Okay? You have to raise productivity. You need economic growth. That's going to, that's going to A, pull a, most people up through, through higher wages, and it's also going to provide the resources for transfers. And in, in, in uh, rich countries uh, where, um, in rich countries, um, you know, incomes are high enough so that uh, you can do a lot to alleviate poverty without having tax rates go up to the point that, that it inhibits economic growth and kills the golden goose. So that's. Yes, so.
Well, um, you know, I think that I think that what you what you do with what you have is more important than what you have, and applying that to education, um, I think that uh, the fact that the U.S. has a a business environment in which uh, uh, people can um, do very well is more important than uh, our admitted shortcomings in education. And I say that because, because for, for two reasons. One is, one, one is that if you, look at, if you look at China's takeoff, okay, after 1970, after the end of the Cultural Revolution, which the Cultural Revolution, of course, nobody was going to school for 10 years and most of the teachers were um, banned to the countryside. So in 1970, all of a sudden, China took off the same way that England took off in the mid 1970s, you know, it was like a rocket. Now, if, if it had been education, which people have argued, um, it's completely, that time pattern is completely inconsistent with the notion that it was people going back to school, that it was education, because that would have been much more gradual, because it takes a long time for each successive group to get into the labor force and then to lift the average, um, um, you know, the average education level of the labor force. Okay? So, So how people can do, so the point is that, that China didn't have an environment in which, in which people could start businesses, could work where they wanted, could innovate. All right, so that's what was lacking. That's, and, and so that simple change in policy from one year to the next is what accounted for this takeoff. Okay, so, so in the context of the United States, we see over and over again that, you know, like, like Russia had fabulous, especially compared to the United States, math education, okay? Well, the Soviet Union had virtually no productivity growth over its life. When those Russians who, you know, were unproductive in Russia came to the United States, all those mathematicians, they did, they did very well. So I think it's the, it's the business and environment. If you can compete, if you can innovate, if the environment allows you to do that, then um, sure, it's better to have a better education system, but um, but that's not what's decisive. What's decisive is, is, you know, is the business environment such that owners and managers can focus on making all those incremental improvements? Is it such that, that individuals are, have an incentive to invest in themselves and raise their own productivity? And that's what the United States is good at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you know, as evidenced by the you know by the fact that um, you know the United States has long had crummy infrastructure, um, you know, you know, an education system that's not really the top, but it's had the most rapid productivity growth of any you know wealthy country. And it continues to have, even, even, you know, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, it continues to have, uh, you know, very good productivity performance. Go ahead. I have two questions. Um, yeah. One is, do you really believe that China has uh, an economy where it's not managed by the government? And, and Comparing no, China to India, which has a much freer economy that, that 
as you're describing, you would expect India to do better based on your assumptions. But, but you know, India has, um, I disagree that India's economy is freer because, you know, it, obviously the gov you know, the Chinese government intervenes. It just doesn't intervene in as damaging a way as the Indian government. Okay, it's reg. In other words, its regulation is much less inhibiting. But it chooses winners and losers, doesn't it? Yes, and absolutely. But everything is relative, okay? So compared to, compared to, you know, in 1970, the average Chinese income was not higher than it was in 1500, okay? So compared to, and uh, you know, before 1970, you couldn't start a business, you couldn't, uh, no, you know, you couldn't live where you wanted, you couldn't work where. You, compared to that, it was a huge liber, economic liberalization. That's you know, that's really what happened from one year to the next. They didn't have you know, they didn't have bet, much better educated workforce. They didn't have more resources. They did more with what they had by liberalizing. And, the, you know, India has um, extremely onerous uh, regulation and extremely, um, yeah, it's very dysfunctional regulation. Go ahead. The poor are always with us. Are they, are they, or are they not was your theme. Your point is that opportunity makes people, and I think you're talking about opportunity to improve themselves better than education, or better than anything else. They're not restricted from improving themselves. It's great if you're a reasonably competent person, but genetics says not everyone, and there's always gonna be a fixed proportion of people who are not terribly competent, can't take advantage of opportunity, and are going to be poor. And I don't know what you or anyone can propose to do about that because it's a fair, and we see them. Well, but, you know, but I think, uh, you know, I think the welfare state, whether a, you know, bi you know, as big a one as Sweden or as, you know, relatively small as the United States is still big, okay. I mean, the welfare state is the answer to that. Okay, I mean, every government, okay, every government of every rich country um, has, you know, has uh, Beatrice Webb's national minimum, okay? Nobody, you know, the government, the government not only takes responsibility for economic growth, it also takes responsibility for providing a, a floor under the living, you know, no one's going to live lower than this floor. Okay, so that's one thing, but but actually, um, the welfare state has, you know, is much more generous than that, e including in the United States. In other words, you know, social benefits, whether in kind or in cash, have grown a lot, and have you know, and therefore do more to reduce poverty of people who, who, you know, can't uh, either temporarily or long term benefit from economic growth because they're not in the labor force or because their productivity is so low that uh, their wages are, they can't earn enough to get out of poverty. But that's what, that's what the, um, the welfare state is for. And, um, you know, and this long argument that has been going on since, you know, since um, the last third of the 19th century about, you know, is big government going to stifle growth? It appears that it's how you do that big government. It's, it's the form of the welfare state, how you intervene, that makes a difference because it's clearly not incompatible, you know, on principle. 
And just to give you one example, I once, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was in a, um, you know, a small group for a couple of days, one, one of which was the Swedish finance minister. Okay, and, um, you know, it was so clear that Sweden has, um, um, they are very tough, on, they, didn't, they didn't bail out their uh, Saab, okay? The U.S. bailed out GM, they, they let Saab go under. They have, yes, they have a, you know, they have a big welfare state, but the, their regulation is such that it does not shield companies from competition, okay? Uh, so companies are under tremendous, Swedish companies are under tremendous competitive pressure, partly because, of course, Sweden has to export to, to make its living, so they have to compete internationally, but also domestically, as a matter of policy, they don't shield companies from competition. Therefore, you know, they have a, uh, it's very consistent regulation, it's also, um, uh, pretty smart regulation. It's very market-oriented regulation, and it shows in their, you know, their productivity performance and their very, very high income. Just back here, real quick. I have a, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, just like government sort of accepts. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, all the way back here. Here you go. Just looking at the air. Yeah. Um, kind of. Uh, so governments sort of accept an, a natural rate of unemployment, like there's always companies going under, there's always people in between jobs, whether, you know, you mean, quitting this one and looking for another yes. one. And, you know, in some, some right. places it's the, lower even, than even when Even when the economy is growing is, very yeah, fast growing, yeah. and, and um, the labor market is exactly. tight, you're still going to yeah, have... Yeah, so there's, there's a natural rate of unemployment. There's a natural rate of unemployment. Do you think eventually... You know, obviously in the 1850s, 90% was a ridiculous rate of poverty. Do you think as it gets lower and lower, governments might sort of accept a natural rate of poverty? Like, there's not much more we can do to help. Sort of along the lines of her question, you know, once it gets down, hopefully one day to like 2 or 3% or something like that, um, and it ends up becoming more of individual, individual efforts going to, you know, helping out. Well, you're probably right because in that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, uh, people whose income is below the poverty rate, or if you look at the bottom 20 percent, there are there are people who are in there because, say, they're they're business people or writers, very variable income, so they have a bad year, so they're so they're in there, but they're not. You wouldn't say that they're, the fact that they were, quotes, poor in one year is a problem. It's not a problem, they're, you know, this is just because of the variability of their income. Another reason that someone might be in that category is that they're a young person, a student, um, you know, so they're not making much money, but, but um, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna make more money um, they're not going to be permanently poor. So, yes, probably there is a natural rate of, of poverty if you just define poverty in purely, you know, what's, you know, your income in a given year. If you were to define it even as your income over, say, five years or ten years, the poverty rate would be lower, right, because it would uh, eliminate those people who are in there, you know, for these transient reasons. Uh, excuse me. I go back to the time of Lyndon Johnson. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so do I, we all. <laughs> right. Not all of us, but right. some. Well, those of us left in the room. <laughs> right. Those of us who really care. Uh, I was a little surprised that you didn't mention his war on poverty. And uh, I remember at the time when he, uh, he had that as a political issue wondering how in the world could you really ever get rid of poverty, and I wonder if you would be able to comment on uh, the efforts of the Johnson administration to wipe out poverty, the war on poverty, and what happened, what went wrong with it, what might have gone right. Well, um, in, you know, 
in the lar in large, it was a huge success because it, you know, radically reduced poverty among older people because of Medicare. Um, so it was it was a big success. Um, you know, obviously, you know, welfare had its you know very serious problems. Um, and, you know, people have gotten a lot smarter about that. But I think it was, a, you know... Maybe you should include that in your speech presentation. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but look, I mean, you know, um, social security, unemployment... If you look at, you know, if you look at... Um, people's compensation in 1930, uh, it's all wages. There are no benefits, okay, no government benefits. And um, now those benefits are a third of compensation, okay? And a chunk of that is, you know, are government benefits. So big, big success. Well, the issue, you know, Look, and also, by the way, the, of course, these programs are hugely popular with re Republicans. I mean, they're... Really? Well, do you know any Republican who is... Uh, ...social security or that we um, get rid of Medicare? What? Am I... Really? I don't think that, you know, if, I don't think so. I may have talked about, well, if it, first of all, it didn't work out that well in Chile. Um, you know, it was worth trying, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not, doesn't seem politically feasible. Go ahead. We have one there. Oh, okay. And then go ahead. Um, I don't think any of this is coming. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was just going to ask, um, in the hypothetical sense, let's say, um, let's say that America passed a law where they would start taxing people based on their income. Um, what do you what do you think would be, if that was the case, the outcome of, let's say, the American debt and the classes of the economy and such? Okay. What do you think would be the case? Well, well you know, um, the income tax, we do have an income tax, and it funds, finances about half of government uh, spending. And it's paid almost entirely by the top 20% of households. Almost, you know, below that, what? The top 1% pays a huge chunk. Um, in other words, the American income tax is highly progressive and, um, and almost, you know, people at the, you know, bottom half of the, uh, um, Income scale don't pay any taxes. In fact, in fact, they have tax credits, so the tax system actually subsidize, gives people subsidies. Um, and um, it, what did you want to know? Did it? It doesn't seem to be having a dampening effect on incentives. See, everything is a question of, you know really of um, sort of what range are you in? I mean, it's like the minimum wage. If you raise the minimum wage from $7 to $10, most people don't think it's going to have a big effect on, on employment, okay? But if you were to, do, you know, go up to $15, then almost nobody would, no economist would support that. Okay, so it has, you know, same thing with taxes that in the range that we're in, 
you know, that, that may cause fierce fights, and it has been causing fierce fights for the le as long as I can remember. But in the range that we're in, once, you know, one, after, the Reagan, after Reagan brought uh, tax rates down from, I don't know, s the top rate from 70 to, um, you know, to under 30, um, you, know, it's you know, the top rate is fluctuated in a very narrow band, and it doesn't seem to be impeding, you know, the United America's economic performance. Well, you know, within, within the, you know, again, it depends on the range. I mean, when, you know, the labor go government in Britain put taxes, the top rate up to 90%, um, Britain, Britain had the worst post-war, I'm talking about the 50s and 60s, performance of, you know, of any European country, um, uh, even though they got the most martial aid. So they obviously, so they were, they, they put themselves in a range that was, that made them very dysfunctional. Um, but in the United States, um, even in, even in the um, 50s and 60s when we had very high marginal rates, we also had, wasn't that rich people were paying more taxes, okay, than they're paying now. Rich people are probably paying more taxes now. When you have those very high rates, you have a, more loopholes, and because because well-to-do people can time time their income and also determine what form they take their income in. The fact is that when Reagan brought those those tax rates down, much more income was reported as and taxed than before. Um, so, but so the fact you know. If you look at the you know post-war performance, it's I find it hard to get really excited about the kinds of tax um, you know the kinds of tax proposals that are really on the table. I you know I find it hard to believe they're going to have a big economic impact because in the range that we're in, doesn't seem to um, you know be that decisive. I don't know that much either, but you know, I mean, there's something else which is if you, um, you know, if you look at, there are you know huge and persistent differ differences in economic performance between countries, but the the only correlate that really stands out is not is not taxation. Okay, because, okay, Hong Kong has very, very excellent productivity growth and has a small government, low taxes. Sweden has high taxes and, a, and very rapid productivity growth. Okay, so I don't think that that's the decisive. It's not decisive. And one reason for that may be that a lot depends on, I mean, these local factors in, you know, which which reflect differences in culture and other you know other institutions differ. Okay, so that if we had you know Swedish tax rates or Hong Kong tax rates, we might not do that well. Okay, but they do fine because because 
um, because you know local differences matter. You know, it's just like you know the fr you know I was talking to somebody about the French, the repressive French educational system. Okay, we wouldn't like it. Okay, but as a consequence of their repressive system, being in France is very pleasant. People are really polite, and when they have a riot, maybe they burn a few cars, but you know they're not you know shooting each, each other up and shooting cops, etc. We have a very liberal school system, okay? And when we have riots, you know, they're very violent. And people aren't that polite, but it works for us. So I'm just saying that, that when people make these sweeping, you know, rigid um, uh, pronouncements about, uh, especially in the area of taxes, you really just have to look at the data because it's just, I mean, I like low taxes. I think, you know, low taxes are better than high taxes, but, um, but it's, hard to, it's hard to show that they make that big a difference. social function, not, you know, from their point of view, it's to make money, right, <laughs> for shareholders, right? All right, so that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. For, for the goal to be achieved, the goal of eradicating poverty, would corporations have to return to that model of philosophical Well, I mean, Marshall wasn't saying that, you know, that uh, all those English firms that he visited were you know, had social responsibility programs or even paid m much taxes. What he, you know, what he showed is that by their efforts to constantly become more efficient, um, to do more with given resources, you know, at any given time, they have a, they have a certain amount of capital, they have, uh, you know, they have a, a labor, you know, whatever their labor force is, being able to, to produce mo more or higher quality with those same resources, that's what, you know, that's what they do. They, you know, they don't do it, they do it because they're trying to survive. They're trying to produce a profit and, um, well, how does that match with eradicating poverty? Because doesn't wages, oh. doesn't wages sometimes become Beca Because that's how, that's how most people get out of, you know, historically, that's how people get out of poverty. Okay, because look, if not nine out of ten people are poor, you can't just redis you know, you're not going to get people out of poverty by redistributing income, which is what, you know, Marx and other socialists were advocating in 1848, okay, because Britain was a poor country then, right? So the only way that Britain, the British, um, population was going to get out of poverty is if, um, if Britain produced more per person, per head, per worker. Okay, that's what, if Britain could do more with their given resources, that was the only way that, uh, that the bulk of the, you know, pop, that you can lift the bulk of the population out, right? Because, because the rich aren't rich enough to do that, okay? And, um, you know, if you look at, like, look at the Soviet, you know, the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 30s, um, you know, everybody was very impressed with how their industrial workers were doing, but the fact is most people in Russia then were peasants, and the way that the urban worker was lifted out of poverty, which they did succeed in doing, is by starving the peasantry and, you know, taxing the peasantry very, very heavily. Okay, so redistribution doesn't do it if 
you are a poor country. So, you know, Marshall's insight was it's, it's the private sector that has, you know, only the private sector can, can increase productivity. So that's what they do, right? Because they're in the business of producing and they have an incentive to do that because they're, they want to make profits. So they're always looking for, so, you know, um, the person who really thought about this in terms of, of you know, long-term economic development was Joseph Schumpeter. And basically, basically, you know, what he said is that any country that could provide a favorable environment for business and for entrepreneurs and bankers, because entrepreneurs depend on bankers, um, could escape poverty, okay? In other words, you could have all kinds of differences on other dimensions, but if you had a favorable business environment, by which he meant uh, rule of law, you know, stable currency, uh, you know, reasonable regulation, um, and that, you know, that favorability, you know, there's a wide spectrum. People try to measure it now, like Canada, you know, there's, there's an index of, um, you know, sort of business, you know, business environment. And, you know, Hong Kong is very high. Uh, Canada is higher than the U.S. Uh, but there's a big spectrum. But so anyway, um, with a lot, of, a lot of differences, okay, so you can have, um, you know, uh, you know, South Korea in the 50s and 60s was, you know, a dictatorship uh, that, uh, you know, had, um, it was like, you know, like China, had a, a lot of economic freedom. Um, and now South Korea is, you know, is a democracy with a welfare state. Okay, so there's a, but what's, what's constant is, is, just like, you know, just like what's true of the United States, what the United States has in common with Sweden is a favorable environment for business. Why is that important? Because, because when managers and owners can focus on making those incremental improvements and innovations, they're, you know, if they're not focusing on pure survival or lobbying the government for this break or that break, if they're focusing on their business, then the result is productivity growth. And if productivity is growing, then wages are going up. And that's how most people get out of poverty. And you're absolutely right. Everybody, you know, there, there's always going to be a portion of the population, you know, that's too old to work, too sick, whatever. And um, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to um, um, be, they're not going to escape poverty by, you know, being in the workforce because it, because they're not in, through wages because they're not in the workforce. Should we do a last question? I, 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 I'd sort of like to go back to the productivity marathon again. Uh, I read an article by you this morning whose title was Productivity, and you mentioned that due to a 1% difference in Britain's uh, productivity, they, they had gone to what you call a second-class <laughs> economy. I don't know if that's true or not. Did I say but that? You said that in the, in the article. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah, right. But due, due to a, a, a difference between a, some standard right. of 1% every year. Yeah. Right, because, see, the thing, is about, the thing about this is it's incremental. I'm, it's, you know, if productivity grows 2% a year, you know, it's, it's the power of compounding. If you do that every, you know, every year for many years, then, you know, that's a big change. Like, like that would lead to a doubling of, of living standards in a generation. Right. If you just grew 2% a year. Well, I, I worry about that happening in America. Because I heard uh, the news, in the news, and I don't know the, the extent to which this is true, but in Germany and the Scandinavian countries, 
they are offering free college education to even to immigrants that come to, the, to Germany. You can go to college for free. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm interested in the community college, and, and, and I'm here because I would like to reduce the economically marginal group to, to, to as small as I can get it through education. So I'd like to you to comment on these two things, a free college education in Europe and, 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 and an effective yeah. uh, community college uh, phenomena to reduce it's fantastic. our poverty group. It's fantastic. I mean, Westchester Community College is such a great institution, and you're exactly right. Look, more people, you know, more people than ever are going to, are going to college. More, you know, m more people, you know, a bigger fraction of the, you know, college age population is going to college. Why? Because in the last 20 or 30 years, the, the premium, okay, uh, you know, the, the um, um, extra amount that you can earn if you're a college graduate versus just being a high school graduate has grown, to, it's very big, and it's still growing, okay? So the rewards of going to college have really gone up. When I was in college in the 60s, teacher, you know, people who, were in, who had college degrees um, didn't make that much more than a high school graduate. And that has changed radically, and that is, draw, you know, uh, is making more people want to go to college, and that's a good thing. And there's, um, of course, there's a lot more, a lot more scholarship aid now than there was in in the '60s. And I don't know about, you know, I don't know about Germany uh, because I don't know what fraction of their population is, goes to university. My I mean, my impression is it's much lower. We're not as badly off as, as, you know, as people sometimes think. We have a lot of problems, but, um, but despite them, we're doing pretty well. Ha, ha, ha.